Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to our uh, stream. This time we will be talking about Tekenu. Uh, what you see in front of you is indeed Tekenu Obelisk of the Sun. It is a strategic dice drafting game for one to four players from Board and Dice, and it was designed by the two great designers and two great T's uh, of game design by Daniele Tassini and David Turzi. For those of you uh, joining us for the first time, this um, this time, well, for those of you joining us for the second or third time, this time we do not have a guest. I will be flying this one solo, but in exchange, I will teach you the whole game. So after the presentation is finished, you will be able to play it yourself. And yes, you will be able to play it today because after the learning video is finished, uh, you will be able to go to our official Board and Dice Discord, where you will receive links that will allow you to play the game on Tabletopia. So you will be able to play the game with friends, old friends, make new friends around the table. Uh, Tekenu will be open for you until Saturday midnight, which is until tomorrow midnight. Now, what is Tekenu? Tekenu, like I said, is a strategic dice drafting game. It's, uh, it takes us back four millennia to the eastern bank of the Nile River, um, where a foundation for the Temple of Amun-Ra was laid. Over the course of 2,000 years, this uh, temple complex was gradually expanded, and uh, now it is known as Ipet Isut, which is the most secret of places, boasting the largest religion building in the world. Today, the site is known as Karnak and it is located at Luxor in modern-day Egypt. Now, what you will be doing in this magnificent game is you will be joining the ancient pharaohs in creating a growing and growing one of the most impressive sites the world has ever seen. Uh, you will be honoring the Egyptian gods like Horus, Ra, Hathor, Bastet, Thoth and Osiris, and um, you will most carefully manage the balance of your actions preparing for the reckoning by the goddess Mat. Now, how does the game work exactly? Let us, let us walk it step, let us walk step by step. Now, <clears throat> let's start with some basics. And for that, I'm going to zoom in to my personal player, to my personal player board, as you can see right now, move in myself a little bit. Uh, I will be, for the purposes of the presentation, I will be using the color orange. And what you see here is a player board. Now, I want to show you the player board first. We will go to the main board in a moment, uh, just because I want to very quickly talk to you a little bit about resources. Uh, in the game, we have four basic resources, which you can actually see here, and that is papyrus, bread, limestone, and granite. We also have other resources used in a game. We have gold, which you can see right here. Uh, gold is special because it is a wild resource. You can use it for any purpose, for any other resource. We have scribes, which allow, we, which allow us to change uh, the values of the dice. And we also have what is called faith tokens. And faith tokens come in very handy when the reckoning of Matt inevitably comes, our heart is measured and we see how balanced we were in life. Now, once again, let's look at the main board. The, oh, sorry. the main feature of the board is the obelisk, which you see or actually don't see here. Uh, the Tabletopia build we have does not have a 3D obelisk, which actually comes with, which will come with your physical copy of the game. That obelisk will revolve during the game, casting shadow, half shadow, or uh, leaving parts of the board in light, and that will change the properties of dice you will draft. Dice which are now located around this obelisk space, and as you can see, dice come in a few colors. There are white, brown, black, um, gray dice, which actually in our case are simply uh, green dice. There are more dice uh, in the bag. As we play, we will be drawing and drafting them. For now, I'm going to put them back. back. 
And basically the idea of the game is that throughout a number of rounds, you will be drafting those dice to perform actions. Both the color of the die and uh, its number is important for the game. So, how do you actually play the game? There are eight actions. You can, you can choose from eight actions when you play your turn. We will start with the six that are depicted here around the obelisk. And let's first concentrate. Huh? Let's first concentrate. I have a little... Ah, there we go. So let's first concentrate on the busted action. The busted action, which you see here, is um, allows you to raise your population and to raise the happiness of your population. As you can hear, as you can see here in the bottom, there is a track, and there are two meeples situated on that track. A bigger one, which uh, signifies your population, which is how many people uh, you are governing, and a smaller one, which is the uh, happiness of your population. As you can see, uh, everyone starts with five population and a happiness level of two. Now, the happiness can move up during the game, like so, but it can never go beyond your population. Well, for, I think, obvious reasons. You cannot have more happy people than uh, you have actually people, even though some of them might be twice as happy as regular people. Now, in order to uh, receive, in order to move your happiness up, what you do is you come to perform the bastard action. Like I said, when you perform an action, you draft one of the dice. And actually, before we dive into this, let me quickly tell you a little bit about one very important feature of those dice. As you can see, the three dice here, uh, the brown, the green, which in the physical uh, game will actually be gray, not green as it is here, and the white are situated on three different rings. Each of this ring represents uh, one of the three states a die can be. A die can be pure, as the white one right now. A die can be tainted, which in this case the green die is, or a die can be unavailable. The unavailable one is always closest to the center. When you draft a die, you choose one of the dice uh, which are in the pure or tainted regions and you bring it to your board. So let's do it now. Let's say I'm going to start with the uh, white with the white pure die and let me move to my player board. That die is drafted, and when I draft it, since it was pure, I'm going to place it on the pure scale. And for now, I'm going to leave this die here. What we need to remember is that the dice value is 4. Now, as I perform the action, I will look at the value of the die. The first thing I need to do is I need to pay to Papyrus. After I pay to Papyrus, I can move my happiness up the track a number of spaces equal to the die value. And for that, I will have to get, I will have to grab this marker and I can move it up four. One, two, three. Well, this is as high as my population can go because, as I said previously, it is impossible uh, with your happiness to go beyond your population. The next step of this action, of the busted action, is um, to take a number of scribes. If the die you used was a one or a two, you will be taking two scribes. Let me zoom in closer to this one. If it is a one or a two, you will be taking two scribes. If it is a three or a four, you will be taking one scribe. And if the die was five or six, you will not be taking any scribes, but you will potentially make a larger move. Now, why uh, is our happiness and our population important? Well, to answer part of that question, Let's now take a look at uh, another action. Let's look at the next uh, action available. And in this, in this case, this is the Toth action. Uh, the action of the god Toth allows us to take cards. Now, there are three types of cards in the game. There are white blessings, which we see here. 
there are technologies, and by the way, they all have different backs. I'm going to flip them for just a moment. So we have blessings, we have technologies, and we also have edicts. Uh, to show you an edict, I'm going to zoom out for a zoom out for a moment. And here we have an edict card. Um, what are the differences between the cards? Well, very simple. The white blessing cards have, are immediate effects which you can play at any time during your turn. The um, technology cards are in are constant abilities which allow you to um, break the rules of the game. And the edicts are cards that actually score you extra points. Uh, at the end of the game and everybody is going to actually start with two edict cards uh, so you will have some to start and i will be talking about them in a moment later for now let's go back to the toth action so depending on the die you choose firstly what you can do after you draft a die you can pay one papyrus to uh, change some of the cards in the display before you make any choices and secondly depending on the value of your dice you will be able to take one two or three of the cards now the first question is which cards can i take from can i take all of them actually not exactly uh, in order to see which cards you need to you can take we look at our happiness our happiness marker shows us which bands we will be able to take from it. And there are multiple bands. Let me zoom out to show you again. We have a uh, we have a tan band, then we have a red one, a green one, and finally a blue one. And as you can uh, see here in the population and happiness track, there are spaces which correspond to those bands. So the moment your happiness reaches uh, a space that is colored in red, you can choose cards from the red band. When your population reaches the green color, you can choose from the green, and when it reaches blue, you can choose uh, from blue. Or to be exact, you can choose one of the bands that is available available to you. So if, let's say, um, let's change the situation a little bit. Let's say my population, my uh, happiness was here. For that, of course, I would need my population to be at least on this position or perhaps maybe higher oh, like so let's say uh, in this case i can choose any of any band any of the four bands and i will be uh, activating operating and taking cards from that band uh, so like i said the um the first thing oh, yes, this was probably a better view for this so once again as you can see right here my happiness is on all of the three uh, colored bands actually all of the four including tan so that would mean i would be able to take uh, any to choose any of the bar band to take cards from it but let's uh, reset the situation a little bit let's say that during the last turn i actually what i actually did is raise my happiness and i have now two bands available which is the tan and the red and like I said, the first thing you can do, let's actually say that this is the die I drafted. It is a brown die and it is a pure die. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place this die again on the pure side of my player board. Now let's come back to, uh, to Toth and take a look at my options again. So like I said, I can spend one papyrus to choose one of the bands and remove all of the cards from that band and then refill it. So if, for example, I chose the tan one, I would remove all of those cards, as you can see here, and I would draw one new technology card and two new blessing cards. And by the way, the cards here, whenever they are taken or removed for any reason, they do not slide down like in many other games. Uh, in fact, each space for a card has a corresponding back that shows you which card goes to that space. So coming back, uh, as we remember, my die was in fact a die of value four which means that I will be using this option here. And I cannot change this option unless I change the value of my die. Without changing the value, a three or a four allows me to spend exactly two uh, papyrus and choose two cards from a single band. So for example, I could, if I wanted to, and I have, I have the red band available, I could take this card, and this card. One of them is a technology, one of them is a one-time 
uh, bless actually this is not the one I wanted to grab excuse me so this blessing card and the technology card once my uh, turn is over we would be refilling those spaces and I'm going to do this actually immediately just to uh, show you how this works exactly so as I said the back of the card corresponds to the space it should be in so I'm going to flip the card and the track e is refilled so this is what the Toth action does. The next action in line is Osiris. Now, Osiris allows you to build, um, to build houses, actually allows you to build mines and workshops. And what is important about the Osiris action is that you will be, uh, you will be not only building buildings which allow you to gain more resources or to allow your production of resources to go up, you will also be um, vying for control over columns here. There are four columns it, in which you will be placing your buildings. And again, just to show you how this uh, works firstly, and each of those columns, by the way, will be uh, giving you points at the end of the game. But before that, let's take a look at how you use this action. So again, you choose one of the dice here, which I'm not going to do right now. You choose one of the dice, you look at its value. And let's say we drafted a die of value five. Uh, if I drafted a die of value five, I would be let me just grab very quickly one of the buildings here. If it was a die of value five, I would be placing that building somewhere in the five row. Um, if it was a value four, it would be this row. If it was a value two, it would be this row. Let's say for now that it was actually a value five. And let's say I decided to place it here in the space with limestone. I'm going to remove the building for a moment just to show you a few things. So firstly, what would happen is that I would immediately take two limestone. This is what these uh, resources depicted here show, that there are two limestone or two bread, or for example, a golden papyrus, when the moment I place it, this is the resource I take. Furthermore, as you can see, there is a limestone symbol here, which I will cover with two arrows up. So I will now cover this symbol and show you what it actually does to our player board. So I'm taking this, covering up this space, and now let's jump to the player board, which is here. And there are four markers here, which show the production of our resources. Limestone, since I got two bumps up on the limestone production, I would move my cube two spaces up, which means that my production, which started at two, which you can see actually here, goes up to four. Now, there is one uh, one more thing that you may want to know about, um, about the production of buildings and placing actually buildings here, which is the first person that places their building in the two row gets to keep this special gold token. I'm actually going to do this. I'm going to move it next to the one gold token I started with. However, instead of receiving two limestone and moving twice up on the limestone production, as you can see, I would only move once up limestone production and receive one limestone. Now, there is one more, one very important thing. Since these are places where people will be uh, basically working hard for us, sometimes it makes them a little less happy. As you can see here, every time you build a building, your happiness goes down by one. So what I would actually have to do right now, right after building this building, is to go is to go to the population and happiness track. Get rid of this little window here and move my happiness down by one. So I was four. I am now on five. Now, the important thing is that if your happiness drops down to zero, you will be unable to build any more uh, buildings right here. So you will have to raise your happiness in order to be able to build more buildings. Now, the next action is the Horus action. The Horus action allows you to build statues. Uh, what are statues? Let's go back to our player board for a moment. And let's grab one of the statues just to be able to show a few things. So this is one of the statues. Whenever you build a statue for any reason, the first thing you're going to look at is you're going to look at its price. You have to take statues from left to right. And as you take them off, the price 
uh, of the statue you're taking up is depicted under that statue, and this is always a price in granite. So the first one will cost you four, the next one three, the next one two, the next one again two, three, and four. Uh, and every statue which you build using the Horus action, you will be taking off your player board. Okay, so we have our statue, and uh, let me just place it out of the way for the moment. And let's, ah, uh, that was too much out of the way, I guess. And let's take again a closer look at the Horus action. Now, depending on the number of the die, uh, I chose, I can actually, every time I draft a die, I can choose one of two options. Uh, one of the option is to look at the number of the die and place my statue in a um, in the obelisk slice shown by the token here. So for example, if it was number four, I would have to look at the Osiris uh, slice. And if it was, for example, number five, I would have to look at Ra, which is here. Or no matter the number of the dice, you can spend it to place your statue on the uh, Hathor space. So let's very quickly look at option number one, which is, let's say that what I did was actually draft uh, a die with the number two. The number two is connected with the Hathor action, with the Hathor slice. What happens is I place my, if I choose this option, I place my, place my statue in the Hathor slice of the obelisk. Now, the why would I do that? Why does it interest me? There are two reasons. There are two reasons. One of the reasons is that all of the statues will score you points on a very regular basis. But the second reason is that from now on, when somebody uses the uh, the Hathor the Hathor action, they will be. Uh, paying, the, 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 I, sorry, they won't be paying. Actually, I will receive from the bank either one papyrus or one red. And similarly, if my statue was in the bastard uh, part, I would be getting, let's zoom in a little bit here, I would be getting two population or three faith tokens. Uh, if it was the Horus space, which we can see right here, uh, I would be receiving one limestone, one, one granite. The Osiris space, would give me one gold. The raw space would give me uh, two happiness, and the half of the uh, toth space would offer me one scribe. Let's zoom back out a little bit uh, and talk about placing statues in other locations. So uh, one of the options I am going to uh, skip just for now and tell you a little bit more about it once we talk about Ra and Hathor action. The last action allows you to place your statue in the Osiris space. And to do that, you choose one of the two spaces and place your statue there. Now notice there are only two spaces. You cannot, if there are two statues there, no more people will be able to place their statue uh, in the Osiris action space. The moment you place your statue, hey, once again, you receive one gold, which you are able to keep. I'm going to remove the gold. And that statue stays there forever. What is it good for? It is good for majorities. Um, so actually, probably, maybe even a smarter play for me would be to place it th th to place this here. Uh, and it counts for majorities whenever we will be counting points for those resource spaces. Like I said, the final option is to place your statue in the Hathor space, but I will be talking about the Hathor space in just a moment, and it will make much more sense uh, when, the, when I tell you how, about how Hathor, the Hathor space works. In the meantime, let's take a look at the Ra space. So the Ra space allows us to place a column in the temple complex. Uh, I will show you the temple complex in just a few seconds. Firstly, uh, to build a column, you will be taking one of the tiles. And again, depending on the die you took, uh, that number, the column with that number will be available to you. So let's say that my die was actually a two. For example, even this two, which I draft and immediately decide to buy this tile. Uh, to do that, the first thing I have to do is I have to pay the cost. So let's again zoom in. In this case, this tile costs four limestone. Uh, the tile right next to it is three, li is three limestone and one uh, granite. And again, 
the tile on the far left hand side is two limestone and one granite. Once I have paid, I'm going to check for one very important thing. I'm going to look at the background of the tile and see if the background matches the color, the shade, shadow or light of the obelisk. Right now, it does actually match because this gray color is great, just like the area I've taken it from is shadowed, which means that I will receive this bonus immediately. So that would mean I would receive immediately to happiness. If, uh, if the um, if the raw space was actually in full light, let me try to demonstrate this. Yes, if it was in full light like so, then this would not this tile would not give me the bonus, but the one with the white background would. If on the other hand it was completely shaded like so, if it was in the dark, then the tile that allows me to make use of the bonus is this one, the one with the darkest background. So what do I do once I um, receive the tile? Well, like I said, the first thing is you receive the bonus. Secondly, you look at the position you took the tile from. In this case, the far right position uh, gives you one victory point. So I would take that victory point immediately. I'm actually going to grab my token and place it on 11, but place the purple back. And then I would place that tile in the temple complex. And for that, let's move a little bit to the right, showing you a part of the Hathor action. So I can place this tile when, wherever I want to. What is also important, I can, of course, rotate that tile the, the way I want to. And um, to do this, basically, uh, first what I'm going to do is I'm going to to place it somewhere here and whatever I cover up with this tile I will receive. I will receive extra points if I manage to match its borders. So the borders around the tile as you can see they are colored. Um, I will also receive points for any buildings that I see uh, that are built around the temple complex. For now there are no buildings but let's take a look at my options here. So if I want to simply, if this is placed in order to receive a higher number of resources, let's say I'm actually, I actually want to receive more papyrus, I would place it right here. And this, by the way, covered up two papyrus and this two papyrus I would receive immediately. Um, let's say, however, that I don't want really resources. And what I want is to score extra points. Well, to score extra points, let's see, I, this would be a smart way to put it. I would put it here and look at the number of borders that are the same as any borders around it. And what is important, you, you match both to the borders of the temple complex as well as to the borders of the uh, of other tiles. So for placing it here, I was able to match two of those borders. And in this case, that would immediately net me two points. Now, the spaces in the corners are special. For every border that you manage to match, you receive one extra victory point. You don't receive any resources, but you receive extra points. And let's say that this is what I actually wanted to do. I would place it here. I would first check for any buildings that are built either uh, in this column or in this line, which at this point is zero. So I would not get extra points for this. And then I would check for the borders. And in this case, there are two borders. Each of them scores me one point. And since it is the corner space, I will receive plus one point for each. So in this case, I would immediately receive four points. I'm actually going to note that just to uh, be, just to show you exactly how this would work. Now, the last, uh, the kind of last step I need to do right now is to also place one of my own columns on this. And I'm going to just grab a column. I'm going to just grab a column, go to this wide view and place this, actually this pillar on my tile. And this signifies that this is my uh, pillar. And this is important for uh, future steps of the game, as I'm going to demonstrate momentarily. In the meantime, uh, one more thing that needs to be done is the tiles will move down until all of the spaces are filled. And then we are going to draw a new tile to the leftmost space, fill that space so there are always three tiles available. 
Right, so we are close to the last action. The last action that is actually depicted here on the board, which you can do, uh, is in fact the Hathor action. And the Hathor action allows you to build a building around the temple complex. So when you build a building around the temple complex, the first thing you're going to do is, well, you're going to grab one of your buildings. Uh, when you build buildings, you have to grab them from left to right. In fact, let's see, yes, you have to grab them from left to right. So that would be my second building in the game. And when you build it, you will decide where to place it. Uh, again, let's take a closer look. As you can see, uh, every space for a building consists of one or two elements. One of those elements, just like here, is the price. So in, a, in order to place a building here, I would have to pay two bread. Same here, two bread. Now, some of the spaces will also show you the number of players it uh, works for. So with two players, for example, I wouldn't be able to place the building here. But if we were playing with three or four, I would be uh, able to place the building in this location. So I grab a building, I place it, and let's say that where I want to place it is exactly here. I pay the two bread, and the next and the following steps, as depicted right here, let me zoom in a little more, is firstly to receive resources. When you place a house just like this one, you're going to receive one resource from its um, from its column or from its row, depending on where it is placed. So in this case, <clears throat> I would actually from every space. So in this case, I would receive one bread, I would receive one papyrus, and I would receive one faith token. Now, remember, when you cover up a space with a pillar, what you do is you receive all of the resources. But if you build a house, you receive just one resource out of each. And just to show you how this would work if I, for example, placed my building here and paid for bread, I would receive one limestone, then I would receive two granite, one gold, uh, sorry, one limestone, one granite, one gold, one bread, and one papyrus. No matter how many resources are depicted here, you will only receive one. Furthermore, if the situation was slightly different, if this was in fact the situation right here, I wonder if the pillar will topple, it didn't, yay. Uh, in this case, again, you only receive one out of each of the visible resource spaces. So in this case, I would receive one limestone, one gold, one bread, and one papyrus. And since the two granite space is already covered, I would not receive any granite. The second step after placing a house is receiving points. Again, let's zoom in a little bit here to show you how this works. Uh, you receive three point for each pillar that belongs to you. And this little symbol, I'm going to zoom in even closer to show you that little symbol, that little pawn symbol with the exclamation mark always means you, right? Always means you. So whenever you see that symbol, that means that something has to be yours in order for you uh, in, in order for it to work for you. And in this case, you will receive three points for every um, pillar that belongs to you. So let's take a look at my situation here, actually. As you can see, I placed, I placed a house here. And as I placed a house here, I will receive three points because it's looking at my pillar, one of my pillars. If I had more pillars of mine here, I would be able to score more points. Now, I told you also that, uh, ah, this is not the place I wanted to go, that uh, when you uh, perform, when you perform the Osiris action, you have the option of placing a pillar, a, uh, a statue in the temple complex. And as you can see here, this shows you exactly this, that you can place a statue there to receive three points for each of your pillars. So how would that work exactly? Let me just very quickly grab another statue. A statue, by the way, just as a reminder, I would have to pay three granite to be able to grab. So I'm going to grab that statue. And let's take it to the temple complex. Now, in the temple complex, there are two spaces. There are two spaces which um, can take a statue. One space is visible right here, 
the other space is here. So if I uh, paid for the statue, I could place it here. Or again, let's play smarter and place it here. Once the statue is placed, again, this is a space with a gold for whoever is first. So I would take that gold and I would also score three points for every uh, pillar of mine that was here. And again, um, as a helpful reminder, it tells us here that you score three points. What is important, the important difference is that, as you can see, you score three points here, but you do not receive resources. Whereas when you build, uh, when you build a house here, you will receive one of the resources in its line or column. So these are most of the actions you can take in a game. There, there is a bit more you can do. Now, the last action is actually hiding itself, concealing on your own player board. And it is this area here. It is the Anubis action. Um, but before that, let me talk very quickly a little bit about scribes. As you can see on your player board, whenever you draft a die, when you, you can spend one scribe, let me actually zoom in even closer here, you can spend one scribe to change the value of a die you drafted by up to two. You can add up to two, you can uh, subtract up to two. An important thing, a die that is of value six will not become a seven or an eight, or it will not flip to the one side. Uh, a die of value one, when you subtract from it, will not flip to six or become a minus uh, one or a minus two. So this is one of the ways you can spend scribes for. The other option is to perform an Anubis action. And if you spend two of your scribes, as seen here, what you can do is you can take any die you want. So let's take a look at our uh, a look at our board again. You can take any die you want, and that actually includes forbidden dice. So I could, for example, take this die. And you take that die, you, places, you place it in the Anubis space of your player board because it does not go on the scale. It is not considered pure. It is not considered tainted. You place it in the Anubis space, <coughs> excuse me, and you perform any action you want with it. You define, you immediately define its color although its value stays six. Of course, if you want to spend even more scribes, you can spend them to change this value once. But uh, once you spend the two, this die is yours and it will not change your scales. And you can perform any action, which means that you can actually decide to decide to perform any of the six action here, actions here, regardless of where you uh, took the die from. That die, the only thing that matters for is, is its value, which again you can still modify using uh, the scribes. So, <coughs> excuse me for just one second. This is the seventh action. And finally, there is one more action which you again can perform using any die, any die that you normally draft, not the die you draft using the Anubis action. Then I'm going to remove this die from here and place it back in its forbidden space. And that is food production. When you produce food, I'm going to take this die just to be able to show it to you more clearly. So when you produce food, you take, you look at the color of the die. And the color, uh, four of the dice are actually connected to the colors of different resources. So in this case, the yellow die is connected to papyrus. Uh, brown dice are connected to bread. White dice are connected to uh, limestone and black to granite. Um, yes, there is another color of dice. There is another color of dice and that color is actually uh, gray or green in this build. These dice are not connected to any of the resources and cannot be used to produce them. But let's say that this is exactly what I did. 
I drafted this uh, yellow die and I place it. This draft, this die was actually uh, drafted from a pure space, so I'm going to uh, place it here and I produce resources. I immediately produce six papyrus. So I'm going to just go there and grab myself six pieces of papyrus. And two, three, four, five, six. Come on. Okay. So I'm going to grab myself six pieces of papyrus. Okay, that is two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, this is pretty good was able to grab six pieces uh, of papyrus. However, I do not get to keep them all. I keep only a number equal to my production. So in this case, my papyrus production, as we can see here, equals two. So I will be able to keep only two of that papyrus. What happens to the rest? Well, unfortunately, the Egyptian gods don't like us to be wasteful. So all of those wasted resource tokens, so in this case, four wasted papyrus goes to oops, goes to the tainted side of the scales. So in this case, this would not be the best idea. We would end up with four, uh, four papyrus tokens on the tainted side of my player board. Um, again, if I decided, for example, to produce limestone and I was able to draft a white die for that, this is the only way to, to produce it. So let's say I actually Let's say I actually did not draft this die. And uh, what I did is, in fact, I drafted this white die and decided to produce limestone. I would produce four limestone and I would be able to keep all of it. None of it would go to waste, which means that none of it would have to be placed on the tainted side of my player board scale. Now, one last thing. Whenever you gain these weird faith tokens, I know I haven't mentioned them yet, but their time is coming, uh, you can keep them next to your player board, or as a reminder, you can keep them somewhere in the middle of your scales, because those faith tokens will be very useful when the reckoning of mud comes, eventually comes. However, before that happens, let's again take a uh, wider look at the board to talk a little bit about the game length and when uh, when you will be scoring points and what you will be scoring points for. So, firstly, whenever every player has two dice drafted on their board, the game pauses briefly for the time of day to change, and that is signified by this obelisk revolving by one step. So let's again take a, take a look. There are two dice on my player board, which means and on everybody's player board, which means the game pauses for a moment. And what we do is we're going to uh, move this obelisk so that the arrow moves from the current border to the next one. Now, the next thing that happens is uh, that if it, if basically, if it is two dice, what we're going to do is we're going to add uh, more dice to the game. And to be precise, after I'm sorry, one second. I seem to have a little bit of technical difficulty again. A small technical glitch. One moment. One, two, three, one, two, oh, yes, there we go, there we go, I'm sorry, I had a small problem with the microphone, I am back. So, uh, like I said, every every two, um, whenever 
Every player takes a total of two turns. We perform what is called a rotation. So we rotate the obelisk one step. Then uh, we look at the shaded areas and we place a number of dice equal to the number of players into each of those shaded spaces. So assuming we were playing two players, we would uh, place two dice into each of those shaded spaces. And if we were in indeed were, there would be a th uh, fewer dice as four of them would be gone. So we place a number, of a number of dice equal to the number of players. And then, once since we rotated, we also change the position of the dice. And this is one of the very important feature uh, of the game, because whether a die is pure, tainted, or unavailable, or forbidden, uh, is basically, to, to see that, you look at the color of the die, and you look at the position it is in. And for example, in shaded spaces, all of the dice, the dice that are considered pure are yellow and brown. So in this case, we move all of the yellow and brown dice to the pure space. Now, the dice that are considered tainted are white, black, and white, black, and gray. So this case, we, in this case, we would have to move those dice to reflect this. And this will be happening for each and every slice. So in this case, now, this is in the light. Since this slice was in the light, nothing changed here. Brown is still forbidden, gray is still tainted, and yellow is, um, actually yellow is also tainted. Now in this slice, the, the single gray dye, which is depicted here as a green, is again still tainted. Let's look here. Uh, pure dyes are going to be yellow and brown, so we would move the yellow and the brown dye right here. We would move, uh, and black, white, and gray dice would be considered tainted. So this would change, the situation would change like so. Now we go to the next slice, which is completely shaded, which is in the dark. And uh, for those two slices, actually, that are in the dark, we can say that black dice are going to be pure, as we can see here. Then yellow and white dice are going to be tainted. So yellow is going to be, uh, sorry, um, brown and gray dice are going to be tainted. So the brown die and the gray die remains tainted. And the white dice and the yellow dice are forbidden. So this would go to the forbidden space. So once we have done that, a rotation ends and we proceed with the game. However, Whenever we rotate with four dice on our player board, and I'm going to grab some dice just to demonstrate a few things, like so and perhaps like so, a mat phase occurs. And a mat phase is different from a regular rotation because during the mat phase, we will during the mat phase, we will be looking at the purity, at the balance and purity of our hearts. And let's let's quickly take a look firstly at the scale on our board. So in this case, I have dice that are placed. I have those three dice placed on the pure scale, and this one die played placed on the tainted scale. Uh, to see what is the value, what, what is basically the weight of my heart, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add all of the pips here on my pure dice and subtract for them everything that is on my um, on my tainted scale. And in this case, it would be five plus four, that's nine, plus four, that's 13, minus four, that is nine, minus another four, that is five. Now, five is quite a lot. And in fact, I want balance. So I'm going to place this faith token on the tainted scale, which means that my total value is going to be a plus four. Uh, this is the function of those tokens. You keep them until a mat phase comes, and when you do, you place them, you, you place as many as you want on any of the scales. Now, the important thing is that this these faith tokens are rather fleeting. So every time you finish a mat phase, you will uh, basically clean this up completely. I'm going to come back to this in a moment, but for now what we need to know is that we are 
at a value that is plus 4. And what does this value stand for? Well, to know what that value stands for, we need to, oops, we need to actually take a look at this mat space right here. As you start the game, as you start the game, your position on the track here is fixed in a very specific way, and I'm going to show you that way in a moment, but every mat phase, your position will change depending on uh, the balance between the pure and impure scale. So I remember when I told you that my balance was at plus four, I would place my uh, order token right here, my player order, order token right here. Let's say that the blue player was actually perfectly balanced, so I can place them on a zero. And then let's say that the purple player has been a bit naughty, so he was on minus three. And that perhaps maybe the, uh, actually the magenta player and the purple player was really good and he is on the nine. So once every player has done this, we look at the players who had negative values. Uh, in this case, the magenta player is at minus one. And that means that, min actually at minus three. So minus three, minus four, and minus five will immediately subtract one point from them. Then, uh, minus, then a player who would be at minus six, minus seven, minus eight would lose two points, and a player on minus nine and minus ten would, would lose three. Once this is done, we're going to take those tokens and place them the closer to zero, the better. So coming, coming from the left-hand side to the right, the leftmost token is actually blue. The next leftmost token is magenta, so he would come on position two. Now, the, the next leftmost token is yellow and finally purple. And this will determine the player order for the next turn. Now, player, when determining player order, uh, the next step before we continue is actually to take everybody in player order will then take one of the bonus cards. And we have those bonus cards actually depicted right here. Um, let's take a closer look at, for example, this card. Each of those cards uh, consists of two spaces, an ANC space, which shows you a number between one, uh, between zero and three, and a bonus space. The bonus space, when you take the card, you receive immediately. The ANC space is used to break ties. So if there is a tie, there would be a tie uh, in the position on the mat track right here, so let's say two tokens were actually, sorry, two tokens were actually positioned on the same number. Let's say that uh, both magenta and yellow were placed on a one. The higher number from the bonus card would break the tie. And if, for example, the uh, yellow player had three and the magenta player had zero, the yellow player would be placed first and then the magenta player would be placed second. Now, once all of those steps are over with the math phase, what happens is that we would be removing everything from our uh, scales here. So that includes any resource tokens, which we would remove back to the stock, any faith tokens. It doesn't matter if we use them or not, they are going to go away. And also quite importantly, we would be removing our dice. Those dice will be going back to the bag. Back to the dice bag. Oops, I was unable to grab them. Sorry for that. They would be going back to the dice bag. And once they are back there, we would again refill the obelisk space with a number of dice. So that the twilight spaces would be once again refilled with a number of dice equal to the number of players each. So again, if we're playing with two, I would be drawing two dice and placing them in each of those spaces. So let's take a let's rotate the obelisk once more, possibly. If it agrees to rotate, and I'm sorry, let's let's take a look at this again. Come on. Mm-hmm. Again, I seem to be suffering a bit of a technical difficulty here. Ah, there it is. So, 
Every two dice we will add dice. Every four dice there will be a math phase. If the obelisk points to one of the two scoring tokens, and we have one scoring token here, this is this token, it's a, it's a token with one white hourglass. There is also another token, uh, which is a token with two hourglasses, and one of those hourglasses is actually orange, and you can see it one here. Uh, it, you can see it here. So, uh, the moment the our obelisk points to a token with the lowest number of hourglasses, so in this case to the one hourglass token, to the white hourglass token, we will have a mid-game scoring. During the mid-game scoring, we will receive points, but we will also have to uh, pay a little bit of bread in order to keep our population in check. So let's take a look at what happens exactly during that scoring. So, <clears throat> whenever you perform a scoring, firstly, you look at the four resource districts on the Osiris space right here. So every of those resource districts, you look at every column and you look at the number of buildings in that column. The player who has the most buildings receives points for that column. So, for example, let's actually grab a few more buildings to... Let's maybe grab a few buildings to show you how this would work. So, for example, there are three players here. There is yellow, there is purple, and perhaps even we have a bit of blue here. Oh, come on. Yes. Okay, so now, uh, right now, what we see here, let's flip those around to make it clear where those buildings are. So for every column, we look at who has the most buildings. In this case, blue has the most buildings, but every statue in above that column, every statue counts as a building for this purpose. So in this case, the yellow player has a building and a statue, which means they have two buildings. The blue player uh, has two buildings, and this means that they are tied. The tie in this the tie in this case is broken by the player who has their building on the top. So in this case, this tie would be broken by the yellow player, and the yellow player would receive three points. Now, if the situation was exactly like this, and then we went to score this column. Since the yellow player has a statue, that statue works for scoring purposes for both of those columns. And that statue would also allow them to receive three points for this column. So they would receive a total of six points. Now, the next place we visit during the scoring is, in fact, the temple complex. And as you can see, by the way, the board actually helps you with reminders what you score specifically. And this white hourglass icon tells you what exactly you will be scoring during the mid-game scoring and during the end-game scoring. So, um, in this case, each player will receive one victory point for each of their statues and houses built anywhere around the temple complex. So, actually, the orange player, would, the yellow player, would immediately receive two points. Furthermore, for every pillar you have, you will receive one point for every building and statue that pillar looks at. So every building and statue that, for, that shares are either their column or their row. And if the situation was like this, again, yellow would score one point for this statue, one point for this building. Only your buildings matter in, in that, so that would be further two points. Now, once uh, the temple complex is scored, we score points for statues that we have built. And for that, we go to our player board. Depending on how many statues we build, we have uncovered some victory points. So we basically uh, sum up, <coughs> sorry, we take the highest value seen in those victory points, and this is how many points we receive. So in this case, yellow player would receive three points. Um, then 
the next thing we have to do is receive points um, for our production. And any marker that has reached the topmost spot, for example, right here, scores two points. We also score points for our houses. So for houses, depending on how many of them we were able to uncover, we again score points for them. We also score for one more thing. So again, let me jump. Let me jump right here. We also score points, three points, for each of the little pyramid symbols we were able to reach with our happiness marker. marker. So if the situation was, for example, like this for the yellow player, the yellow player would immediately score three points, as it is shown here. So three points for each of those pyramid uh, markers. For the happiness of our people, we will score three points. Finally, uh, each player must pay the sum of all bread uncovered in their building row. And again, the, there is a reminder right here showing you that you have to pay a total of bread depicted here. So for example, if, this, if the yellow player also built this building, they would have to pay two bread. For every bread you cannot or do not want to pay, you would have to lose three victory points. And watch out, the game starts you off with 10 victory points specifically so that you don't get too smart and don't just lose the points you don't have. Now, if you drive your victory points back down to zero, and even after this scoring, for some reason you are on zero or you just have a few points and losing victory points for not having bread would uh, bring you below zero, you stop at zero and you have zero points. Now, finally, if the scoring you went through was actually the second scoring, so if it was scoring, if there was no scoring one token, which is removed after the scoring, and the arrow traveled all the way around to the second scoring, which, by the way, is going to be round 16 of the game, you will perform those same steps, which means you will score everything as I've just told you. So everything that has this white hourglass icon, but also everything that comes with a, an orange hourglass, to, uh, hourglass icon. And these are actually two things. One of them is the player order track and the other one are all of the, are your edict cards. The hourglass, this, the player order track is actually very, very simple. If you are first, you're going to score three points. If you are second, you're going to score two points, but only if you are playing with three or four players. With two players, only the person who is first is going to score three points from the player order track. Now, finally, you will score points for your edicts. And for that, let me draw a few edicts right here because there is a rule you need to know about edicts. So the first rule is out of all the edicts you have in your hand, you will be able to score three. The second important rule is that out of those edicts, you can score only cards that have different symbols. So let's say that my pool was actually, let's take a look at this, this, that I had those five cards. So the two things I need to remember that I will be able to score only, only three cards, and I cannot repeat the symbols here on the top. So as you can see, this card here and this card here share a symbol. So I immediately have to choose which one of those two I won't score. So let's say I don't score this one. And then out of the cards I have remaining, I can still only score three. So regardless of the fact that these have different symbols, I cannot score all of them. So let's say that in the end, I decide to score these three. And how you score them is actually very simple, because each of them not only shows you, but also tells you exactly how you score points for that card. Now, this almost concludes what I wanted to uh, 
the explanation of the game and what I want to tell you about the game, there are just a few small details I would like to talk about. Firstly, remember when we talked about placing, um, placing your statues on those spaces? These spaces work a little bit differently depending on the number of players. So if you are playing with two players, whenever any player, including you, drafts a die from this slice, you will receive that statue's benefit. With three players, that does not happen. But when you place the statue, you immediately receive that benefit. So if the statue was placed in the Osiris slice, you would immediately receive one gold as shown here. Finally, when playing with four players, you do not receive a benefit immediately and you don't trigger them yourself. There is enough going on on the board so that players will be able to actually provide you with a lot of resources if you decide to invest in statues. And the final thing I wanted to tell you is one that you will be doing right at the start of the game. But I wanted to tell you about this rather later than sooner because this makes much more sense, honestly, if you already know how the game plays, which is when you start the game, you will start with variable bonuses. And for those of you who have played Teotihuacan, you definitely, definitely know what this is, because when you start the game, you will draft a number of these starting bonus cards. And you will draft those cards until every player has two of them. Once you have two of those cards, you immediately receive the bonuses from this card and the number on the top of those cards, the total number, will tell you your order in the game. So, once you have done that, and this is the only thing these cards are used for, once you've done that and everybody has taken their starting bonuses, then you will be ready to play uh, Tekeno. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a complete explanation of Tekenu, uh, uh, an explanation which I tried to provide to you uh, using Tabletopia and my uh, meager skills at moving things around Tabletopia and grabbing things with the mouse. I am sorry for that. Uh, it's something I've ne I was never able to play games that required any level of dexterity. So this might have been a little slower than it would have been if I was able to use my own 10 digits. Um, this covers all of the rules of the game. So what happens now is for any of you that are interested in playing the game, you can join our uh, official BND Board and Dice Discord channel where you will be able to find the links and those links will allow you to open your own tables, play the game. We, the uh, helpful employees of BND, will also be there and will be happy to answer any questions you might have regarding the game and uh, regarding uh, and regarding any any rules questions, any questions, maybe strategy questions. I I really don't know. I'm. I don't feel I'm really that good at this game to be able to offer you uh, the right strategy. Um, oh, one thing that I think I failed to notice, this is also important. As you can see, when the game starts, some of the cards are not yet drawn on the table, uh, drawn and placed here uh, at their spots. The moment somebody's population um, reaches a certain band, that band is immediately filled. So the moment somebody's population reaches uh, the green band, you immediately take the cards and you fill uh, each space much like what I am doing now, until all of those places are completely filled. It is entirely possible that they will be filled rather fast, depending on your strategy and the bonus cards you will start the game with. So once again, if you want to play Tekanu, go to our Discord server. You will find uh, links there for Tabletopia tables, and we will be also there to answer all of your questions. For now, uh, thank you very much for joining me during this stream and uh, for looking at our 
newest meaty strategy game i hope you have a lot of fun with and for those of you who appear on the discord channel to ask any questions or just say hello i'll be happy to see you there in just a few minutes thank you very much and see you during the next um, streamed board and dice game good night everyone